Okay, well, let's get started and people are welcome to come after the fact and um, and I'm just, yeah, there's no waiting room so people can come on in. So I'm so glad that um, you all found it, first of all, because that's what we were talking about is that sometimes it's a little hard to know about these things. So I'm so glad because we have this um, beautiful opportunity of the month of Elul leading up to the high holidays to prepare um, spiritually, mentally, emotionally for the high holidays. You know, so often people say, oh, you know, and I'm not talking about you guys, of course, but some people say, you know, I came to the high holidays and it's just, you know, it just kind of washes over me or I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in the mood or I wasn't ready for it. It's like, well, okay, that's, um, that's what this whole month of Elul is supposed to be, is this process of preparing so that when the high holidays arrive, it's not like, wait a second, you know, I never took time to really um, reflect and look inward. And um, we know that taking time to prepare for anything makes an experience even more meaningful. Um, and so I'm just so glad this is just one of the many ways we're preparing for the high holidays. And I know that because it's all online this year, that just adds another layer of like, wait, what? It's high holidays. It doesn't feel like high holidays. I'm in my home. Last week, there was a Rabbi Joseph taught a class at this time about how to make your home a sanctuary, what it means to make your home a sanctuary so that um, when high holidays come around and you're sitting in your living room, you've done something to make that space feel sacred so that you can remember. And we know, and I'm sure this is why you're here today, that music plays a huge part in setting the mood, setting the atmosphere, helping to make the high holidays even more meaningful. And I see someone else is signing on right now and I'm so glad we'll just, we'll just keep going. So um, a lot of synagogues, you know, we at Beth Israel, the clergy sat down with the senior staff, hi Annette, and said, you know, what is it that makes the high holidays so special and meaningful? And even though we're online, we have to make sure to still bring that to the congregants. And of course, one of the biggest pieces of feedback we got from the congregation and from everyone was the music. The music is what helps us feel like we have arrived at this time of year. Isn't it amazing? And so um, I wanted to start with a little um, activity, which you'll have to forgive me. Cantors think these kinds of activities are really fun, so I, I hope you do too. Um, <laughs> but you know, we're, we're, we're kind of a, a special, kind of a dorky breed when it comes to Jewish music. So I hope you like it too. Maybe you are in that category too. So, okay, here's the game. It's just a little game. I'm going to sing the Micha Mocha to the tune of a season, like we do at synagogue, and you get to name that season or name that holiday, okay? So as soon as you know, unmute yourself and say the answer. <laughs> okay, here we go. How about this? Micha Mocha Yes, Hanukkah. Isn't this fun? Okay, let's try another one. How about this? Micha mocha ba'elim adonai Micha mocha nedar ba'kodesh nora Forum. That's a really good guess. It's in the spring. A <laughs> spring. It's in the spring. Does anyone know that one? It's to the melody of Ad Dear Who, Ad Dear Who, right? Yeah, Passover. You were close. Okay, okay. we got one. We're, this, is, this is okay. We can still uh, come out on top. Here we go. How about this? Ami Chamocha Ba'eli Madonai. Ami Chamocha Nedar Ba'kodesh Nora Tehilot. Oh, safe Nora Tehilo. Oh, safe Oh, today will Mary Mary be. Oh, today will Mary Mary be. Which was that? That was for Rick. <laughs> that was that was the Purim one to the tune of Oh, once there was a wicked, oh, wicked, wicked man. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you have to forgive me. I find this. <laughs> no, it's great. 
<laughs> okay, how about this one? Listen to this one. Everyone's going to get this one. Mi chambo chabayli madonai, mi chambo chanadar bakodes. Hi, holidays. Hi, holidays. Okay, so some of these melodies are very ingrained in us. Some of them maybe not so much, but you know, I'll make sure to sing them more around the springtime for all of you. But um, it is truly amazing, isn't it, how certain melodies just transport you to that moment in time. And that is what a cantor's job is, is to preserve these Jewish melodies that remind us of what time of year it is, where we are in our calendar. And um, they really, these melodies help us mark time and to orient ourselves. And, um, you know, the Torah trope, the way we chant the Torah is the same thing. So the Torah trope, based on whether it's high holidays or Passover or, you know, um, depending on um, what time of year it is, the way we chant Torah sounds a little different as well. And so um, it's our music that helps us understand, you know, what time of the week it is. Um, there, theoretically, if a Jew was, a traditional Jew was in space somewhere and didn't know what day it was or where they were and was dropped down into a synagogue somewhere in this world, they would know instantly if it was in the middle of the week or if it was Shabbat or if it was in the winter or if it was in the springtime based on the sounds of the Torah being chanted and our prayer our liturgical music. So um, that's kind of, you know, one of the reasons I love being a cantor is this special, um, special role that music plays in our liturgy in our lives. And we know that music helps us connect to the past because you all certainly have songs that you'll play at home and you'll, it just transports you right back. You're like, oh my gosh, summer of 1977. That was a really good one for me because my husband was born, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, it just transports you right back to that time and place and you start, you smell things that you smelled when you first learned that song or you feel emotions that you felt when you, when you experienced that song with someone. Um, it's truly amazing. And so music is one of those um, most, most powerful tools we have in Judaism and in the world really to help us connect. So in terms of high holiday music, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, I want to talk about how the high holiday music, that music which is so old that we don't even know the composer, and the high holiday music which we do know the composer for, why does that melody help express um, the beautiful ideas that we're exploring on the high holidays? So what are some of the ideas, um, messages, themes that we try to grapple with and understand and reflect upon over the high holidays. What do you guys, what do you guys think? What are some of the general themes and ideas that we explore on the high holidays? What would you say? Go ahead and unmute yourself. I think Annette, you're speaking, but I can't hear you. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiving. <laughs> Forgive and forgiving. What else? Annette, are you speaking? Because I can't hear you. Anyone else have an idea of other themes? Renewal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's right now with a little, it's introspection, like looking at yourself. Looking inward, right. Right, looking inward. Absolutely. Renewal, returning to Shuva, right? Returning to our truest selves that we know we are. We are all good people and we're constantly remembering what we can do to return to our best selves. We have this image of Malchuyot, that's the name of a section of our service even, meaning coming from the root Melech, king, of this sovereignty, something bigger than ourselves that we are all connected to. There's some of these images that sometimes are helpful to us and sometimes they're not because they limit us by um, um, describing God as, uh, more human-like than we know God is. So, but there are these ideas that we can't help but pop into our minds. And those are images of like God on a throne with a big, the book of life, who will be, you know, we pray that we'll be sealed for a good year, um, be sealed in the book of life, all these images. Um, sometimes we have this image of God as a judge. For some people that's really um, troublesome. And for some people it's very motivating and 
Um, there's all of these different images of God um, that we explore on the high holidays. And we hope that that's helpful because everyone connects with the idea of God in a different way. We um, hear the singing of Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king. Um, we're gonna talk about that more later. Um, so, okay, all of these ideas. So what I want us to do is as we're hearing some music and speaking about the music, that we are keeping these ideas in mind and thinking, how does the music, how does music in our lives help express these ideas, help us, um, usher us through um, this process of forgiving, accepting forgiveness, renewal, returning, introspection, all these beautiful things you said, holiness. How does the music, music is so powerful, right? What emotions does the music evoke for us? And um, what kind of music do we usually associate with the high holidays? All of these questions let's think about as we are listening to some music today. Um, but just a teeny bit more background, and that is um, about where our high holiday melodies came from. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good, good. I, I know I've been on Zoom since March, but it's still odd to not hear your mm-hmms and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, those kind of noises. I miss your noises, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So um, a little background on where our high holiday melodies come from. You know those melodies that just some, make you say, oh, that just sounds so Jewish. And we don't necessarily know who wrote it, but you say, I don't know why, it just sounds so Jewish. I feel like I already know it. You can't help but sing along or to feel connected to it. Those melodies, um, we don't necessarily know who wrote them because they were written before people were notating music and writing down a composer. Um, and so we call them me Sinai tunes. Have you heard that phrase before? Me Sinai tunes means um, we're saying they come from Sinai. They come all the way back from Sinai. Clearly Moses received those melodies on Mount Sinai. Okay, we don't really mean that they came all the way from Mount Sinai, but we mean they're so old, we don't know exactly who wrote them. And so we do know that these melodies date back to the 11th or 12th centuries CE, common era. And we do know that we somehow, this is what's amazing, have preserved about 50 of these melodies that date back to the 11th and 12th century. And that's without being able to write down music. That's without the internet. <laughs> that's without, somehow we pass down these melodies. Now I don't wanna to take too much credit because I wasn't a cantor back then, but cantors had a lot to do with it, let me tell you. So orally, our people preserved these melodies throughout the generations, which is truly amazing. And so what would we do with our most precious precious melodies, well, we'll use them at our most precious, precious days of the year on the high holidays. And so there are certain melodies that we hear on the high holidays, whose melody, which melody dates back to the 11th and 12th century. And now, of course, over the years have evolved and, and modern composers have arranged them in different ways and designed different instrumentation um, and different singers have interpreted them in different ways. But there's these core themes of melodies that still stick with us. And they are melodies like We don't know who wrote that phrase, but we know that it is me Sinai tune from a very long time ago that we've preserved by incorporating into our services. There are things like that, some are very rhythmic and easy to join in with. There are things like, right? So much more chant like, um, many more many more. And so um, what I wanted to do was, um, was to let us listen to a few of these me Sinai tunes and hear um, while we're listening, you know, what are we thinking about? What emotions does this evoke in me? You know, how does this melody um, convey the messages and the themes of the high holiday so beautifully or not beautifully? I don't know. Didn't mean to assume. What makes the melody so powerful? Um, and um, so let's start with one of our oldest melodies, and that's the Great Alenu. 
Okay, now I have to apologize ahead of time if we were in person, maybe we'd have live music, I don't know. I'm hoping that the sound is okay through all of the speakers and Zoom. So I wanna share with you this melody of the great Alenu. This is sung by um, one of my colleagues and friends, actually someone who Cantor Kahana mentored as well. She is a cantor in Chicago, in Glencoe, Illinois. Um, her name is Cantor Markowitz. Markowitz. Okay, so we're, here we go. Please tell me if it's okay or if it needs to be turned down or turned up, I don't know. Use your Zoom sign language for me in just a moment if you would. going to stop it there. I don't want to, but if we're going to hear a few melodies, I want us to have enough time. Oh my gosh, I just love, I just love hearing um, my friends sing that so much. Um, okay, so thoughts, um, any thoughts and reflections about why, um, what emotions this evoke, why this melody, why is this so associated with high holidays, this, um, this liturgy um, is, um, is all about you know that everyone one day will realize the oneness of God and come together and it's upon all of us to to praise God and to remember that we are a, a unique unified people. So why did what did you notice about the melody? Did anything stand out to you that was like oh yeah that's high holidays? It's majestic. Yeah. I I, I belong to a small synagogue that used to hire Robert Block. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's gone now more than 10 years. And he, he would, we would hire him every high holidays. And as soon as I heard it, I could see him right in front of me bowing to the ark. It was like, whoa. <laughs> really? Even though it was someone else singing, you have such a strong association with him singing it. Majestic. I mean, talk about majestic. Talk about a place to have majestic music. It's, a, it's big. It's big volume. It fills a space much more than some of the more catchy tunes. <laughs> yeah, it's majestic. It's big. It fills a huge dome sanctuary. What else? Did you hear? So, so what makes it majestic? There's so many things to talk about. It's so interesting. What makes it majestic and big sounding? Do you, what do you think? There, there was a lot of vibrato in it. And I'm not sure if that does it. Maybe. What do you, yeah, what do we associate with vibrato? Like strong and big? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's kind of tall. Yeah, she's kind of tall. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, what about the choir backing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, we're not alone. This is a community, right? Something about the organ, which in Judaism is, you know, relatively new from the 1800s, but Still, it's just such a majestic instrument holding down the, you know, the foundation of it all. Did you hear how the melody went to, I was pointing at all of you, did you hear how the melody went to da 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 It went to that high holiday theme, motif, we can call it. Um, and then there was this part where it went, Now, what's that sound like when it, what does that sound like? It's a shofar. Yeah, there's so many places in our high holiday music where the composers 
put in that shofar as a wake up. Remember, this is our chance. This is the time of year where, of course, we want to spend the entire year reflecting and, and, um, and remembering that we can make change happen personally. But if we don't get to it, this is the time of year. Um, so that's, that's something to be listening for, the shofar sounds in our music and the, the high holiday motifs. Um, there's something about the from the kind of sounds like from the heavens, maybe coming all the way down to earth. Um, reminding me kind of of the choral um, Amen on the high holidays. Kind of sounds like um, maybe the angels, you know, agreeing with us. The angels are with us um, praying. Um, so these are all things to listen for. Let's keep going. Um, let's, I know that everyone, Cole Nidre has so, um, has such an emotional impact on people that I feel like a lot of people say, you know, if I haven't heard Cole Nidre, it's not the high holidays, you know, when they finally get to hear it, they say, okay, it's the high holidays now. Um, and why is that? And it's so interesting um, because the history of the text is um, kind of complicated. So I don't know if you all know about the, the, the text of Kol Nidre that we chant on Yom Kippur evening. Um, it comes from a statement in the Talmud that says, one who desires to annul vows should do so publicly, standing at the beginning of the year. And so this comes from a time when um, Jews had their own legal processes for everything, or their own um, were governmenting their, their own community. And it was um, a legal process that in the coming year, basically saying in the coming year, if I make vows to God, this is just between people and God, not between if you make a vow to someone else and don't keep it. If I keep, if I make a vow to God in the next year and I do everything I can to keep it and I am not able to, um, I, that this legal formula um, makes these vows annulled and void and that I should not be held accountable. Like I said, this only refers to vows made between a person and God. Vows made between a person and another person need to be um, figured out amongst the people. But this was a legal process that was very important to the Jews. And um, over time, the text evolved for legal reasons. Um, but there was this tradition that every year at the beginning of the year for these legal reasons, that um, it would be chanted three times, the first time starting soft and low and gradually getting louder and louder and louder, making it official that if I have tried everything I can, that these um, vows will be annulled if I cannot fulfill them. The melody we know and love today, oh good, and to get <laughs> the melody we know and love today um, began in the 15th century. Um, and has so many of those um, Mycenae melodies and motifs, in, um, including uh, melodies taken from the great Alenu itself. Um, when Reform Judaism was, um, when Reform Judaism originated, the Reform Jews said, um, you know what, we really, we really pride ourselves on being rational Jews, on being intelligent and doing things for a reason, um, which was really important and beautiful. You know, they're connecting to the modern world. They just, they're celebrating their emancipation and the enlightenment. And they said, you know what? We don't, we're, we don't go by this legal process anymore. We um, follow the legal process of the country we live in. We don't need this anymore. You know, what, we don't need to sing that take up time singing this three times at the beginning of our service because it's not applicable anymore. And originally the reform Jews took it out of the Yom Kippur service for a long time until people said, oh, but the melody, the music moved me to feel something um, that was unexplainable. Um, and then we realized, oh, just because it's not part of our legal system anymore, we can, um, doesn't mean we can't find meaning in it. And so um, our beautiful Mach so ooh, oh, that's kind of weird. Hold on a second, can you see? <laughs> it's invisible, it's invisible. <laughs> okay, this is really weird. I'm showing you my Mach so but you can't see. Um, our High Holiday Prayer Book has beautiful read readings in it to remind us while we're hearing the traditional text of why it can still be um, meaningful to us today. It says, let our speech be pure and our promises sincere. 
Let our spoken words, every vow and every oath be honest and well-intentioned. Let our words cause no pain, bring no harm, and never lead to shame, distrust, or fear. And if after honest effort, we are unable to fulfill a promise, a vow, or an oath, may we be released from its obligation and forgiven for our failure. Let our speech be pure and our promises sincere. So um, a beautiful reminder that, well, first of all, how powerful music is, because people said, oh, I need that melody. We can't lose that melody, the Reformed Jews said. And a, a reminder that although the words originated for um, legal reasons, uh, we find such meaning in it today. And so I wanted to share with you um, just part of a recording by another colleague named Cantor Ozzy Schwartz. He is the cantor at Park Avenue Synagogue in New York City. He is very well known in many ways and always has been, but he has become even more well known all of a sudden for his rendition of a Don alum to the tune of Hamilton song. But <laughs> this is him chanting Kol Nidre. And we'll just listen to a little bit. Listen for those high holiday motifs. What makes it so Jewish? Why is it so powerful that the Reformed Jews said, we want it back? It accidentally stopped, but I actually think it's okay because we, um, I want to make sure we have time to hear um, even more. Um, okay, what did you think? What did you think? I had a hard, this terrible urge to stand up. <laughs> yes, good point. <laughs> good point. Isn't that interesting? <gasps> Hmm, I just um, recorded my masterpiece Torah that will be on the Facebook tomorrow about the power of standing, right? And our associations with it and how, you know, just how, what a big role standing has to do in our tradition of this is important and this is, you know, out of respect and pay attention. Yeah, it's so interesting. <laughs> you could have stood. <laughs> I closed my eyes instead. I think I, when I stand, I tend to close my eyes during Kol Nidre, so I, yeah, I did that part. <laughs> oh my gosh, right. Do you hear that melody that, that's like, nah, nah. it's really unique um, in terms of what I mean by unique is you don't hear it much in Western music. So when people say, oh, that really sounds Jewish, um, it's often because of the mode that the composer wrote in. Um, and in this case, it's our Mi Sinai tunes. We don't know the composer, but we know that um, in Western culture, two of the most common modes are a major scale and a minor scale. And, and many of you already know this. And it has to do with the intervals between the notes. Um, and each culture have their own scales, their own modes that um, 
make that are a part of their culture and Jewish culture. One of the most common scales or modes is this mode called Ahava Rabbah, which includes that um, flatted second. So it's do ra mi fa so fa mi ra do, which is different than do re mi fa so. Yeah. So um, that's often including in this in Kol Nidre. That's what that sound kind of sounds like you're leaning in or yearning for something, right? Or crying out, remembering a time. Um, so that's what you're hearing when you're hearing that that sound. That's a, a Jewish modal scale, um, which there are many of, but that's that's that one that um, we hear so often, like in Havana Gila, Havana Gila, or in Yismechu Vimalechu Techa Shomri. That's that Jewish modal scale called Ahava Rabbah, which is interesting. Okay. So let's um, let's see here. What time is it? Oh my gosh, we're almost out of time. There's so many things to listen to. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. I guess I hate doing that, but I will because um, uh, we had planned on this being an hour. I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, maybe I'll just play you a tiny bit, just the tiniest little bit of um, an an Arab Rosh Hashanah. Um, Kiddush, blessing over the wine. This is actually going to be me singing um, last year at my synagogue in Deerfield, Illinois. And um, this is a melody by um, Max Janowski, um, who, um, who was born in 1912, died in the 90s, and um, was from Germany, but spent most of his adult can, um, not cantorial, he was not a cantor, I'm sorry, uh, most of his adult life in Chicago, actually, and so he influenced a lot of, um, a lot of Jewish music in our country, including Avinu Malkeinu, which we'll get to in a moment, but, um, and so what you're noticing is that all these composers, as time goes on, takes these Mycenae tunes and makes them their own, adds their own musical instrumentation, adds their interpretation. So here, I'm just gonna play a little bit of it and see if you can hear the high holiday themes within. And I see someone else just joined. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm late. Will there be a replay um, of this? Um, that's a great question. It is being recorded. So let me find out how I can get it to you. Thank you very much. Yes. I'll put my email in the chat. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So that was Max Janowski's Kiddush. Oh, thank you. Annette has been posting the recordings on the virtual. <gasps> oh, okay. Hello, virtual world on the website. Okay, great. Um, Marilyn, I'll still, I'll, I'll make sure to email you those details. 
Um, Thank you. Yes, yes, definitely. So I, I saw you get your guys' light, eyes light up when you heard the dun, 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 when you heard the choir come in with the high holiday motif. And then there was, um, I don't know if you noticed when I sang, he, uh, hmm, I sang it, but now I can't remember. Yom Teru Amikra Kodesh. This is the day of Trua. That's the that was kind of um, a shofar motif in there. Yom Teru Amikra Kodesh. Um, so that's kind of kind of neat. Um, did you all hear anything else that you wanted to to reflect upon? That was the volunteer choir um, at Congregation BJBE in Deerfield, Illinois, there singing with me, um, which was always an honor. Okay, it's nice just to hear a few different settings of things. And, and like I said, you know, the, these are based on the same melodies, the Mycenae tunes, and different composers interpret them in different ways. So um, this High Holidays, um, you know, uh, the settings that are done that Kendrick Hanna leads here at Beth Israel are um, a little different, sometimes the same and sometimes a little different because there are so many different interpretations. So I wanted to do for the, the, the last 20 minutes here, I just want to do a little um, comparison and, and, and listen to how different music expresses the same text differently. I find this really, really interesting and I wanted to look at the text Shema Kolenu which is a piece of liturgy that we say right after we all stand as one community and say from A to Z, from Aleph to Tav, these are sins we may have committed. And as a community, we stand in support of one another, um, whether we committed them or not, we support one another. Um, and we say, al chet shechetanu lefanach, I have sinned against you. Um, and then we, have, we, we read the list of ways we may have sinned against God. So right after we go through that confession, that vidui, we say, Shema Kolenu, God, please hear our voices. And it's a plead. It's um, a prayer. Please hear our prayers. Um, and so um, one of the most common um, compositions of Shema Kolenu is by Max Helfman, not to be confused with Max Janowski, but Max Helfman was a Polish American composer, um, 1900 to 1963, and conductor and educator, as so many of them were, like Janowski, um, who wrote this. I think you'll recognize it. And the singer I chose to share with you is Jan Pierce. <laughs> it's kind of an old recording. It's so hard to stop these pieces of music, but um, did you recognize that version of Shema Kalenu? What do you think? Hear our prayer. Please, God, hear our prayer. How does it express that text? It gave me chills. But do you realize you were rocking during it? <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what it did to you. So yeah. Not, yeah, I didn't realize I was, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My little Apple speakers couldn't even handle it. You know, <laughs> yeah, could deliver enough of it. I know it's so big. <laughs> yeah. 
it took me back to my childhood days going to shul with my grandfather and watching him daven with the cantor in the front of the shul. Wow, that's a beautiful memory. Mm -hmm. Memory. Yes, his, you know, um, of course, the, that man's voice is, um, well, way back when, it was only the man's voice we heard. And so for so many, it connects you way back when. Um, of course, now kids are, <laughs> I remember when my husband said to me, when I went to cantorial school, he's like, oh, it's so funny to see men in cantorial school. He grew up at Beth Israel. He said, oh, I forgot men could be cantors. But <laughs> so, so for most people, you know, most people, they associate cantorial music with a man's voice. And so many of the new generation say, oh, okay, this is, um, you know, are, are um, so beautifully aware of the woman's voice in cantorial music too. But um, it's a beautiful memory you shared. So yeah, the grandness of that, it's like the Shema, that big octave leap from us. You know, we, we know that, of course, God is not uh, in an up direction, but there's something about that big leap to the heavens that feels so, so much like um, connecting to something bigger than us, connecting to um, a higher power. Um, it's very demanding, right? Like, you will hear my prayer, <laughs> um, as well as pleading. So something completely different, and that was with the organ, of course, and Healthman so beautifully takes the Jewish themes, that Jewish modes, and, um, and weaves them into a more modern twist. Um, but here is something completely different. The same text, mostly. It's here our prayer. Let me find it. But this one is written and sung by Debbie Friedman. Now, how does this express the same text, but in a completely different way? completely different, right? Written and sung by Debbie Friedman, who was born in the 50s and grew up in the folk movement and uh, was a song leader at camp and really um, created a movement of Jewish music that um, encouraged everyone to sing along. And how did she interpret this Shema? Now, granted, this was not, she did not write this for the high holidays. Let's just keep that in mind. But just in general, how does she express this text, but in um, a completely different way? For me, it was a very private sound. <clears throat> she was singing it for her and her message out very privately. I love that. That just gave me chills, what you just said, right? It wasn't a public, hear our prayer. It was a personal, hear my prayer, right? What? Anyone else have thoughts? I have a question. I heard that Debbie Friedman died a few years ago. What happened? Yeah, she died in 2011. You know, I can't tell you exactly. She had a rare, um, she lived with a rare disease for a long time, and I can't name it for you. Um, that's how rare it was. Um, so yeah, it was very tragic. That was when I was in cantorial school, actually. Okay, thank you. Have I met you before today? 
That is a fantastic question. I would love to to play Jewish geography with you and find out. <laughs> are you are you the new cantor? Yes. Like the new second cantor? Yes. Yeah. I don't yes. believe I've met you before. I'll turn on my camera. Well, you're recording this. I'll leave my camera off. But nice to meet you. <laughs> So nice to meet you. I look forward to seeing you more, whether it's on Zoom or hopefully in person one day soon. But yes, I'm um, Raina Green, uh, Raina Dashman Green. I was I worked at Beth Israel ten years ago, also as Raina Dashman before I was married. So, um, so um, it's been nice to reunite with everyone after so. Nice to meet. Yes, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, okay, isn't that so beautiful? And there's something about the guitar that's um, really reflective and helps you know you we would we talked at the beginning judith you mentioned i think it was you that mentioned part of this time is to, to look inward introspection and so far all of these melodies we've been talking about are majestic and big which reminds us that we are part of something bigger than ourselves and it's inspiring but hold on a second we're supposed to also be looking inward and finding melodies that help us look inward and reflect is so important um and so as cantors, we're always trying to find a balance between the majestic moments, the reflective moments, the meditative moments, the moments that help us connect with one another. And this is done in all different ways. I don't want to run out of time before I play you someone that you will recognize. Avinu Malkenu we will end with because, you know, how appropriate is that? Now, Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, sometimes people hear that and think, this is so outdated. Why are we saying our father? Why are we referring to God as father? Our new prayer book has changed that where it never says our father, our king. In fact, it just what they do is they just stick to the Hebrew to try to kind of so that we don't have an association with our father. It says it still says Avinu Malkenu, which is Hebrew for my father, our father, our king. Um, but um, they did that in a way to try to help um, not place a gender on God. Um, it's supposed to be very um, all encompassing, this idea of my parent, my God, my king. And so those two things are so different. It's supposed to say, you know, God is comforting and guardian like a parent. And God is, this is my first Zoom crash I've ever had. Emmett, I'm teaching a class right now. <laughs> Go find Cousin Adrian, please. <laughs> this is the first time this ever happened. Sorry. Go with, it's okay. Go <laughs> with Adrian. I'll show you my friends soon, okay? I love you. There's a first time for everything. You gotta, you gotta love working from home. And he just learned how to open doors himself. So it's supposed to be my guardian, my protector, my parent, my king, my sovereign, my... Um, all-knowing one. It's supposed to say God is all of these things. This is um, so comforting to know that we are surrounded um, in all of these different ways um, by God. And so I'd love to talk about it more, um, but we're running out of time. So I want to- Someone had a question in the chat. I think that that's a virtual background of the CBI sanctuary, right? Yes. Isn't that fun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I want to play you Max Janowski's Avinu Malkenu, which is the most um, common um, version of Avinu Malkenu, although it was only written in 1951. But I would say today it is most certainly what people think of when they hear Avinu Malkenu, written by Max Janowski. He was the one I told you was um, German and um, was in Chicago making so much Jewish music. And who is singing this but our very own Cantor Kahana.
this is on a, a, a published CD that Cantor Gahana um, was on many, many years ago that I actually um, purchased before I met her. Um, so when I got to meet her, wow. Um, okay, so we're all familiar with that, Avinu Malkenu. Let's, because we're running out of time, let's just um, listen to the last Avinu Malkenu I want to share with you. Some people would say, oh, what do you mean someone composed a new Avinu Malkenu? But like I said, this one that we all find so beloved that we might think, oh, it's me, Sinai. It must have been handed to Moses at Mount Sinai. It was actually written in 1951. So here is an Avinu Malkenu that was written in 2015 by Josh Nelson. This is the last composition I'll share with you today and um, completely different. How did he um, present this text in a completely different and beautiful way? Our parent, our king. Here we go. Gosh, I am completely hypnotized by that melody of Avinu Malkainu when he goes, when he goes all the way up. <sighs> what did you guys think? Is it, how does it feel to hear a different melody for Avinu Malkainu? It sounds different. Very different. Very different from Janowski's. Yes, Arlene. Um, is he the gentleman from New Jersey? Josh Nelson. New Jersey or New York? Yes, he's Josh yeah. Nelson Project. He's from South Orange. Is he? Yeah. yeah I, I've heard him speak to, volu to my volunteer group. Really? Speak to your volunteer group. Okay, there's also a gospel singer, Josh Nelson, so it's not him. <laughs> but so, yeah, I have to check that, which one it is. Yeah, Josh Nelson. Um, he is a Jewish um, composer, educator, producer. Um, he tours around. So yeah, that's so neat that you encountered him in that way before. He is a um, classically trained artist and um, you know is prim primarily on guitar and piano. Um, interesting, isn't it? Kind of similar to the comparison between, sh what were you gonna say, Carla? I was just gonna say it, his voice was a very modern voice that just, you could tell he incorporated the original with a more, I don't know, today sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Felt very personal. Like not, usually the, to me the whole, pro, that, that prayer is very communal. It, when he was singing, it felt very, like very personal on his end. Yeah, yeah, so once again, it's more, 
maybe a more meditative interpretation of the text. Right, it's so nice to have the communal feeling, that majestic feeling of something bigger again, um, something bigger than ourselves. And then also, just like with the Shema Kalenu, just like what we were saying, it's nice to have this moment. Oh, but I need my own moment right now to contemplate this. How do I feel about this? Um, we all have our own uh, relationship with, with God and Judaism and the high holidays and the world. And it's just so fascinating to me how music um, and composers can share their interpretation through music. And in this way, music is like Midrash to us. So Midrash is the commentary on the Torah. So traditionally Midrash means the rabbi's commentary on the Torah, but what I'm saying is that music is like the composer's Midrash on the prayer. What does the prayer mean to me? That's, you know, they're, they're not just, when, when composers are creating a melody, they're not just thinking, well, what do I feel like playing today? They're thinking, how do I express this text and what does this text mean to me? And when it comes to Jewish music, I think a lot that comes down to what are my beliefs about the world? How do I experience God? And that's how they're going to write the music. And so they help us experience the high holidays in such, um, such a meaningful way. And we know that music is just can be this source of um, inspiration and majesticness and comfort and hope and strength and that it evokes different emotions in us, different people, different times, you know, what might um, make us emotional one year might, you know, make us feel a different way a different year. And so each year we come to the high holidays, hopefully just with an open heart and an open mind and let the music, let the words just wash over you and um, take what it is you need to hear this year. Um, we are, um, we're coming up on a very unique high holidays this year and I pray, pray that you'll all um, figure out a way, yeah, to make a sanctuary in your home. I don't mean anything fancy, I just mean think ahead about how you're gonna create a sacred space to experience the services so it doesn't just feel like you're getting work done on the computer or something, you know, if there's any way you can figure out a way that you really, you know, maybe you get a little dressed up, no pressure, but just anything that's gonna help you feel like it is the high holidays, the high holidays have arrived. Because I know once you hear the music, it's gonna start to settle in once you see and um, hear the rabbi's words. And um, I hope that you'll notice the, our, the choir worked hard on two virtual choir videos that they're gonna be sharing. So you're gonna see all of, you're gonna see not the entire choir, but many of the volunteer choir members' um, faces on the screen singing. And so hopefully that's gonna be very comforting to see our congregation in, in that way too. So I'm wishing you all very meaningful high holidays and I look forward to many more conversations about all of these, um, about all of these types of things that bring so much beauty to our lives. Thank you, Lashana Tova. Shana Thank you, Tova, everyone.